are a lot of perks about going last, quite frankly. I get to be compared to dessert, which is awesome. <laughs> you know, the thing about the dessert, though, is we all want it, but we know we don't need it. I don't know what the application <laughs> is about me there. I don't know. Makes you think about one time we went and we were having a meal at someone's house and we were having what my wife calls Mexican stack up, which is just her word for nachos. And so she sees my plate and it stacks multi-layered. So we were having that meal and I was making my way down the counter and I was getting this and getting that and really one of everything was on my plate. And I was like, oh man, that cheese dip looks so good. And I mean, I'll confess this to you. So in line, I took a chip and I dipped it into the cheese dip and I took a bite and I was like, that's not cheese dip. Mm -mm, what is that? What, what is that? And they're like, oh, that's hummus. <laughs> no, no, mm -mm. no, no. No, no, that belongs in that garbage can that's right under the counter is where you're going to put that hummus, all right? So uh, in some ways, I feel like the hummus of today. Uh, you know, Glenn and Kirk have done wonderful jobs. And Brandon and, and Case, under the leadership of the elders, have pieced this together this, so wonderfully well. Um, man, I feel like I'm the hummus here. This, that just dumb, I don't belong up here. And sometimes, I'll be honest with you, as a, as a younger person, which thank you, Brandon. Um, you know, the, if you're a bit younger, you, sometimes you might think, ah, sometimes I just don't feel like I fit in. Well, hold on to that for just a moment. So my dad is a preacher, and he has been preaching in the same location for about 30 years. And it's the congregation that I was fortunate enough to grow up around, and I became a part of the body of Christ there at a young age. And that's where I was formed spiritually, with those people and under my Father, and I will forever and into eternity be grateful for my Lord, for my Father, and for my wife. But undoubtedly, that is my spiritual heritage. But you know what's interesting about my dad? He has never, I would say, never preached one time with his shirt untucked. <laughs> and I don't make a regular habit of doing that. But isn't it interesting that just the way someone's shirt tail lays, you can almost tell something about who they are. And at the very least, we have thoughts that are processing within our minds. <gasps> Does he not know? My father has never, to my knowledge, preached in a building in jeans. Now, I don't make a regular habit of it, but isn't it interesting? I did these things on purpose today to make this point. We are quick at times to start drawing conclusions about people simply because of the material that covers their legs and the way that a shirt tail lays. I find that to be interesting. And I draw out that point and want to make that illustration the onset of this lesson because when speaking for a generation that has been described so wonderfully they want to know why, and we want, I want to know why with everything. Dad, why do you always got to tuck shirt in? Why are khaki pants, why is the material of khaki so much better and, and holier than the material of denim? Because quite frankly, my denim jeans probably cost more than your khaki pants. <laughs> so if expense equals holiness, then I wonder who's more holy. <laughs> Now, all of this is done in jest and illustration, okay? Because here's what the younger generation really wants to see. Not what clothes you wear, but how your heart is clothed. 
And what they want to see is not how neatly pressed the outside is, but how closely you've been knit to Jesus. Now, I think it matters what you wear, okay? And I think in certain situations, you can wear different things and be okay. And I'm not trying to make light or make fun of anybody who has differing opinions, and that's fine. Uh, if you're here tomorrow morning, I'll be in a suit and a tie, even though at times I get a neck rash from it. But I want to make a point. Because as we try to think intentionally about the next generation of leaders, leaders who are, coming with, who are coming up and being spiritually formed within our congregations, I am so grateful that we have congregations that are willing to be part of this day to think intentionally about those people who are coming up next. But as we think about those people, we need to wrestle with the fact that they have a completely different worldview than what some of us do. And with that being said, is it right or is it wrong? I think neither. It just is what it is. And so we can either live in fantasy land or we can live in what is reality in front of us. Working with what it is and what we have, forming it to make it better, or burying our head in the sand and ignoring it altogether. I think those are our options. Okay. I'm grateful for you. Very grateful for you. My wife and I just recently bought a house. And I went out in the backyard because I thought I needed to get rid of some enormous shrubs that have turned into small trees. And these trees were disgusting and old. And so I, I took my axe out there. And I have a chainsaw, but, you know, I'm 31. I'm not going to use a chainsaw, all right? I'm going to take that axe. I'm going to melee on this thing. And I was whacking away. And I was getting it. And I was wearing that tree out. Well, after about 30 minutes, one branch cracked. <laughs> and finally fell down. Woo! So I went to Lowe's, and guess what I bought? No, I bought a new axe. Come on, I'm not using a chainsaw. <laughs> I bought a new axe. Now, oh, now watch it. I took that new axe, within three minutes, that whole tree was down. Why? Sometimes, we use our axe so much that we forget it needs to be sharpened. And a sharp axe can work efficiently and effectively far more than a dull one. So I appreciate the fact that you, as a man of God, and as a young man who's wanting one day to become a Christian, I appreciate that you see the need to sharpen your axe. And undoubtedly, I think you have been benefited by being here today. So what do we do now? We've come to this place and at this time. And we've been shown there is a leadership problem in most churches. And when the current generation of leaders are gone, what will become of the church where you worship? And that day is coming. So will you step up today and determine that you are going to be next in line to lead? You may not have to do it today, that is, lead within your congregation, but you absolutely can and should be preparing to do it today and determine that you will be that man who steps up to make the claim, I am next. You may never be called upon, but you definitely can not stand next to those who will be called upon, who will lead, giving them longevity and strength. I need you to decide to be next. Now I'm going to talk about somebody from Scripture, and he's going to be our case study to make a point. But here's what I want you to know about I am next. You don't have to be young to be next. You just have to be somebody who hasn't chosen to be a leader. And so you as a leader, guess what? You're young. Like Kirk said, from 17 to 97, it doesn't matter. From 7 to 97, if you haven't led before, you need to make the statement today, I am next. Because the Lord's church is in desperate need of men to take the calling of men and to stand up as men and be men. So will you make the claim and will you live the life to answer the calling, I am next? Here's what's interesting about, let me talk about young people for just a little bit more. Do you know the name Frank Abagnale Jr.? One of the greatest con artists the world has ever seen. Who by the time he was 15, 16, and 17 had conned thousands of people for millions of dollars. And done numerous different things that would absolutely blow your mind. Have you ever read the book? called Do Hard Things? 
by Alex and Brett Harris, uh, two teenagers, I believe it was on the northwest coast, who decided they wanted to break the mold of what teenagers were known for. And so they, they started making some life changes, and inevitably it turned out into a book, which I thought was fascinating. You might want to read it. Powerfully written, based upon powerfully lived lives of teenagers. I don't know if you know the name Laura Decker, who sailed, sailed around the world at age 14. Nick D'Alessio, who sold an app to Yahoo for $30 million. Guess how old he was? 17. Sarah Blair, who in 2014 was elected to the West Virginia House of Delegates at age 18. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't lead. I can obviously speak with Scripture. Let no one despise you for it. But the way you conduct yourself, the way you carry yourself, and the way you prepare yourself, and not just for the future, but for the present, to be a leader in the Lord's church, is a ministry the world needs, and is a ministry that God is expecting you to be involved in. I am next to lead. Let me tell you what leadership is not. Leadership is not these things. And we have a problem in the Lord's church. And, and quite frankly, this is something that I've been bothered by for several years. I heard this a lot when I was, uh, uh, I guess Glenn said, a boy preacher. Am I, can I still be a boy preacher? <laughs> the, bald, the balding on my head says not. But when I was earlier in my 20s in preaching and working with the congregation, I kept wanting young guys to help lead, men to come into a leadership position. And I'd go and I'd talk, and if I didn't know that guy very well, I'd go to this individual who's highly connected. I'd say, hey, what do you think about that guy over there? And here are the, some of the statements that I got. You ready for him? Well, he may not teach or talk much, but boy, he's a worker. You know, he's not the gather people around him and lead kind of guy. It's almost like back in those days, I remember thinking, man, if you're just a good old boy who just goes along and gets along, it's almost like in some of our churches you've reached the pinnacle of spiritual leadership. That all it takes to be a man, and a, a, a Christian and a man is, well, make sure you're here, stand on the back wall, open the door, and then pull chairs at the fellowship meal. And since when has that been spiritual leadership? I don't think it is. We need less of that and more of these things that we've been discussing today. Leadership is not standing, and no offense to anybody who's on the back wall, sat there all day long. I sat there all day. But if your Christianity is a back wall Christianity... And all you do is simply hold a door so people can come and go as they please. Are you influencing people or are you a prop? So we need men. Men like generations ago who will take a stand with God, with Scripture, counter-culturally counter influencing people for Christ. Not just to be a good old boy. And I've got nothing against good old boys if they also lead spiritually. Here's what I think leadership, and, and as we consider this, young people only become, nor, normally become what they see. I remember my father telling me, son, the greatest form of respect is mimicry. And as a kid, I'm like, what in the world that is mimicry? When they act like you, look like you, and try to do what you do. I remember from childhood, as young as I can remember, waking up accidentally early on a Sunday morning, going into my closet and grabbing that suit that I was only supposed to wear at Lads to Leaders when I led my song. But I grabbed that suit anyway, and I put on my clip tie, and I walked out to the living room, and I said, Dad, I'm ready to go. He said, Son, I'm proud of you. You know why I put that suit on? That's what I saw my dad wear every Sunday. You know what I had in my hand? My Bible. Because I saw my dad do it almost every day. And boy, I hope my sons are doing the same thing for me. And years down the road. But our young people will mimic what they see. And so if our churches are filled with back row, back wall men, guess what they will try to become? 
Let's slip right into it. What is leadership? Leadership can be boiled down to two words. I believe choice and influence. Choice meaning making a decision when faced with two or more possibilities. And influence meaning the capacity or power of persons or things to be a compelling force on or produce effects on the actions, behavior, opinions, and etc. of others. Leadership is a person who has the power to influence and chooses to do so. Let me take you into a case study of a guy named Titus. Turn, if you would, to Titus chapter 1. I believe I've got the, the scriptures on the PowerPoint. And you can flip through those case as I read. <clears throat> so in Titus chapter 1, good, verses 1 through 4. If you're not in your Bible, you can look up here. Because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to take God's word for it. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in His Word, through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. This is his intro to his letter to Titus. He says to Titus, my true child in a common faith. Most likely, Titus is a man who was converted to Christ with Paul's help and Paul's leadership. They have a good relationship. Let me take you to another text, including Paul and Titus. This is in Galatians chapter 2. Flip there in your Bible, open there in your phone, or look up on the screen. I believe I have it up there. Fantastic. Starting in chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what the Word says. And I find this to be so interesting. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas... Taking who with me? Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, I set before them the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But who was with him? But even Titus who was with me was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. And yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what in the world is Paul talking about? Well, if you're a Bible student, you, you might know, and if, you're, if you don't know, let me tell you something, because this is absolutely powerful to me. Titus, who was most likely converted to Jesus through Paul's leadership and influence, Titus obviously has been with Paul and with Barnabas in Jerusalem at some time when there was a conflict going on about circumcision or uncircumcision, about if they should accept the new law of Christ... Or do they also have to be circumcised to abide by the Mosaic Law? We don't know. Where is that in Scriptures? In Acts 15. And so if this is the case, that Titus, who was converted to Christ through Paul's influence, was with Paul when he was in Jerusalem at some argument or some conversation, some debate that took place, it was probably in Acts chapter 15. Now turn there. Let me read and highlight some scriptures here to set the scene. Because if you're not familiar with this idea of, well, now I'm a Christian, but I also have to do this, then you're going to miss everything here in Acts 15. You see, this is fascinating to know the context. This is at a point in the history of God's plan of salvation that the new covenant had been ushered in in this area, and the old covenant still had a great influence and, and a great power on people. And so they were wrestling. The Hebrew letter was written to a group of people who were wrestling with this idea of new covenant life, but also with these old covenant laws that's so ingrained into who they are. Boy, I can't imagine how they were tugged and how they were pulled. I can also, guys, I can't imagine the faith that was required to leave all of that to become a Christian. Can you? We're so fortunate to grow up. Some of us in generations of Christians, that's me. So fortunate. I can imagine the life of some of you who probably were converted from the world and, and the nothing that is out there to Christ and the fullness of the life that's in Jesus. I can't imagine your faith. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for being an example to me and others. But that, that context that they were in, Christians, Christians 
Some who held to the idea that now that Christ has come and he had, he's fulfilled the old law and it's now done away with, all you have to do is, is, is follow Jesus and be immersed in the laws that he had talked about, meeting his blood there and that immersion that bearer would call baptism. But then some people are like, yes, that's true, but you also have to do this. So after you become a Christian, you also need to abide by the Mosaic law and become circumcised to be accepted into the fellowship of faith, which is completely inaccurate. But in that first century context, it, uh, it was everywhere. People are like, what do I do? Okay, so now we're in Acts chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. So we're talking about Christians. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, did, you did I highlight that? I, did, I should have highlighted that. After they had no small dissension and debate with them, which is the scene that I want us to be aware of, it's probably a lot like this one, but way less cordial. Kind of like when everybody says amen and it's super loud and it fills the whole room. I love that. I have to ask for amens where I preach. Uh, it's my, uh. I don't know if that's a, a me problem or someone else problem. But after, after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, this was a hotly debated topic and a highly contentious situation. And debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others who were, appointed to go up to, who were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So, being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. But when they, came to, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them, how the Gentiles had received salvation. You know, Acts 10, Acts chapter 11. As the, anyway. But some of the believers, notice in verse 5, but some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, they rose up and said... You see, they didn't just sit in their seat. They didn't just raise their hand. They didn't quietly come up and, and say, hey, we need to discuss this. The Bible says that they rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And so can you see the dissension, the debate? Can you see the tense moment that Scripture's cluing us in on? What if Titus was there? What if Titus was there being a young man in faith? What if Titus was there in the background hearing this happen as Paul and Barnabas stood up and they made their claims, as Paul and Barnabas led the way and they were the spearhead, if you will, and Titus was there, a young man in faith who's convinced that he's doing what's right, but now all of a sudden it's being challenged by everybody around them, by everybody in front of him loudly and boisterously and ungraciously. Can you imagine what it took to stand there? So the apostles and the elders, verse 6, were gathered together to consider the matter. Which, by the way, I love how this seems to be open discussion in the Lord's church. Man, we need to, be, we need to have the ability to have that. And after there had been much debate, there again, the contentiousness... After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the, word, hear the word of the gospel and believe. And he goes on to simply say this, You don't have to be circumcised to become a Christian. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. It's a new law and a new day. Here's the new teaching. But here's the point I want to make. Can you imagine what it took, if in fact he was there in that moment, to stay to stand and to become a spiritual influence. You see, young people or young in leadership people, what does it take to make the claim, I am next? It takes faith to stand and to stay and to be spiritual. How? How do I live by the creed, I am next? But not just I am next, but I am now. You see, my leadership is not just upcoming, my leadership is now. Why? 
Because my preparation for leadership is absolutely something that can influence and change other people. So it's not just how am I next, but also how am I now? Let me talk about geese for just a moment. Why do geese fly in formation? I think you know the answer, but the parallel and the illustration I think is beautiful. Two engineers got together and calibrated in a wind tunnel why geese fly in formation. They said this, each goose flapping its wings creates an uplift for the goose that follows him. So the whole flock gains 71% greater flying range than if they journeyed alone. That's why the leader of the V formation falls back periodically to let another leader take the point and why the rest stay in line. When we choose to take a stand and to stay and to become spiritual, we do not stand alone. We stand in a line of men that has come before us, that are with us, and will come without us in the future if we don't stand there. But if we do take a stand, 71% greater distance. What does that mean? My life is better when I take a stand with the other men who are leading. My congregational life is better when I choose to take a stand with the men who are leading. My spiritual life, my spiritual future, the people around me, my children who are with me, my wife who's next to me, everything becomes greater because of the strength of the group that I'm standing with. Did Titus stand alone? No. Why could he stand? Because he wasn't alone. So it's not just I'm next, but I am now. I am right now getting into line, drawing myself into formation. And so we need young men to choose to start flying towards the front. At the very least, it's time to get in line. Make the choice to be a leader. Take a stand with God and influence others to do so. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. If my faith is comfortable, it's probably because I'm, do I'm not doing something I, I should be doing. So when's the last time you stretch yourself just a little bit? Maybe it's time to get off the back wall. The back wall of the church building? Get off the back wall in your marriage? Get off the back wall as a father? And jump in line. Take a stand. Your soul depends on it. Your congregation depends on it. Your wife, if you have one, depends on it. Your children depend on it. Titus chose to stand. He said, I, I'm next, but I'm not just next. I'm now. Which is why Paul said, I leave you in Crete to put what remains in order. Now as we leave this place, You'll go to your place. And will you work to put what remains in order? For your family, for your faith, for your God. Paul makes a wonderful statement in Philippians chapter 3. One of my favorite texts in all of Scripture. He says, not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect. I'm not. But I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So let those of us who are mature think in this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will, will reveal that to you also. Now, I'm going to offer an invitation, but this one's going to be a bit different. If you're ready to get off the back wall, to live the I am next, but I am also now spiritual life. If you want to be somebody who is, you know what, my past is my past. It's made me, it's shaped me, but it is gone, and I am what I am now, and I'm going to move forward, straining forward, pursuing what lies ahead. If you want to press on and need help, what better place than now? What better time than this? 
to be surrounded by men who want you to jump in line so they can lift you up and be stronger than you were before. God needs you. Respond now as we stand and sing this song together. Amen.